All right, welcome in a Monday morning Locked on Syracuse podcast. Happy to have you back with us for a full week here. Lots to get to on the show today. We will dive into some of the spring football takeaways so far, how camp is going, because the spring game is coming up this week, Friday, 7 p.m. on ACC Network. We'll have our buddy Drew Carter on later in the week, but we'll discuss some of the storylines of the spring game. And Syracuse women's basketball has a new head coach, Felicia Leggett Jack is coming back home. We'll discuss that big hire all coming up on the pod today. Our Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome on in. It is the Locked On Syracuse podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen each and every weekday. Tim Leonard and Tyler Aki, happy to be with you for another week on the pod today. So, Ty, a couple things to get into before we start out talking about the spring football takeaways. And I do want to remind people that today's episode of Locked On Syracuse is brought to you by Stat Hero. Stat Hero is reshaping the way. The you play fantasy sports, dozens of house-based games to play daily. No sharks, no funky props, just your skill versus the lineup you choose. Sign up today at stathero.com slash locked on. First off, did you see the Tucker Dordovic goal over the weekend? Oh I know God. you're not. You're no, not a big I, lax I'm guy, not, but man. I'm not a big lax guy, but I saw that. And I it was so sick that I sent it to to my like group chat of friends from Syracuse where there are bigger lax heads in the in that chat too like sure. our buddy Drew who's going to be on the show with us later this week he's a huge lacrosse guy calls some lacrosse games our buddy Fred he's a huge lacrosse guy he's like mm-hmm. one guy who just got siphoned into it when he went to Syracuse so <laughs> I, I said like holy you know what like this this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen like I I know I'm I'm not the biggest lacrosse guy but like that was awesome yeah. and that was I think it was number one on top 10. Yeah, number it? one. On I mean, top I don't, I don't, I'd love to know what would have been better than that. Because right. that if you did like a year long top 10, that would be in the conversation of like the best plays in all of sports for the entirety of the year. Yeah. It also got me thinking, when was the last time that a Syracuse play was number one on top 10? I would guess it is, was Gillen's half quarter. That That's what I, came to my mind. But I don't know if I'm missing out on another buzzer beater or another crazy play that just isn't jogging my memory right now. But that is, it's pretty amazing because once I saw the play or I first saw like tweets about it and was expecting it to be a crazy behind the back goal or something, but that's something that I wasn't even envisioning knowing that it was crazy things too. Like if he misses or if that (laughs) gets saved, you look like the biggest tool in the world. (laughs) Right. I'm trying to think of an equivalent because if you if he did a behind the back, I would say that's almost like doing a between the legs dunk in transition or something. Yeah, but or like this if you was try to like, make a one handed catch, what, like when you're wide open and you just try to make like a one handed catch, right? And, and if you were to, to fumble it a little bit, yeah, I think yeah. Th- those are some. I mean, th- don't get me wrong, like what what Tucker Dordovic did is a more impressive feat than a between the legs dunk or a one handed no football doubt. catch. Yeah. Like that was like. I guess technically between the legs, <laughs> right? Uh, but I mean, I, I've never seen anything like that. And I know yeah. a lot of people are saying it might be the greatest goal in Syracuse lacrosse history. And I know the old heads are having their way with that a little bit, but I think the Gary gate think, one might, might be a the, little the Gary more. gate one is, is obviously up there, but like, I'm just saying it, if you're getting me out of my seat for lacrosse stuff, <laughs> like it's going to take the cake in my book. No doubt. Well, that was cool. Another funny thing that I saw come across the Twitter timeline last night are our pals at Inside the Portal have another scoop. Oh, all right. What do we have here? I didn't see this. So you're going to spring this on to Syracuse. And I want to be forward facing about this before I get into it. This is a total joke of an account that we have made fun of on this podcast. They take themselves seriously. Yeah, right? they do. Which they take is... themselves. They're not like a, a meme account. They're not big game boomer who goes out there and puts out Excel documents that makes people mad. Yeah. No, th- this place takes themselves seriously. 
and they're tweeting a lot and they're coming up with these sources and reports. <laughs> the latest is a tweet last night at 10 p.m. on Sunday night. Bryant star Charles Pride is very likely to commit to Syracuse if he enters the portal per source, a Syracuse native, which... Would you be interested in Charles Pride if he came? I mean, I guess he led the I nation guess, in scoring. Like, yeah, uh, that was Peter Kiss, wasn't it? That led the nation in scoring. Oh, sorry. Charles, yes, Charles I'm Pride's mixing the, up the players. Yeah, yeah. He's the okay. other star on the team. Um, not like I, I'd be cool. That's with a totally it, I guess. different one. Then I'm not, I'm not that interested in Charles like, Pride. I, for yeah, some reason, like, I mixed up because I remembered when they played Syracuse, he had right. a decent game. But yeah, okay, Peter Kiss. I would maybe be interested, but Charles Pride, I don't know if he's ready to make that leap. Yeah, it would feel it would feel more of like a story than a than a acquisition you're getting. Like, like listen, this team needs to overhaul the roster for next year and needs to get super talented super quick. And guess what? You can do that, right? Like look at what mm-hmm. Iowa State did. And I'm I'm not here gonna say that TJ Otzelberger's yep. yeah, I'm not gonna say that TJ Otzelberger and Steve Forbes are better coaches than Jim Beheim. They're not. So Jim should be able to do this. He should be able to turn the roster over in a year and get this team back to the tournament after his first ever sub 500 season. So I'm, I don't think Charles prides the piece that gets you into the tournament. Every single piece that you're adding this off season. Cause again, you're working, I think with limited chess pieces, given the number of players you're having coming in and the likely number of players you're having coming back. You've got a couple pieces to work with in the portal and they both have to be impactful and significant enough to get you into the NCAA tournament. And yeah. I don't think Charles Pride's one of the, the places I would waste a bullet on. He doesn't move the needle, for sure. So anyway, that report has no credence. It's the same account that said Joe Girard is transferring. I think they said Armando Baycott's looking to transfer, which he may have different visions of that after UNC's going Yeah, on he's transferring run. to the NBA. That's where he's yeah, transferring to. Yeah, that, that could happen. Uh, speaking of the ACC and just kind of the runs in the NCAA tournament so far, it's become a storyline. Three of the final eight, when you include Miami, were in the Elite Eight from the ACC. Most of any conference after entering on a sour year and a lot of bad headlines. Duke, UNC are squaring off, which is unbelievable that they're meeting in the Final Four. And Duke ran some 2 3 zone to get to yeah. that point. So there were some Bayheim chatter over the weekend about that, I think. Um, I, I will say this before I get into the, the Bayheim case stuff, I was at the Miami and Kansas game in Chicago. Yeah. And I got to say hat tip to those Miami fans because really they showed up. I thought it was going to be a Kansas home game. I thought it was going to be like a 90, 10 split in the building in terms of percentage of fans. It was probably 65, 35. I did not expect. And, and like in terms of, noise level like it was the rowdy miami group that was there it was like the the football the drunk football fans that were there that showed up (laughs) so like from a noise standpoint it was it felt 50 50 i know you're gonna see everything on twitter and it was like oh kansas like showed up in the built no like miami showed up miami was the more impressive fan base that showed up given the expectations going into that so hat tip to and it was in chicago just it was in chicago which is a huge kansas market like that should have been an absolute home game for Kansas. And the fact that Miami showed up, not just against Kansas, but they showed up against Iowa State from everything that I heard, too. And mm-hmm. Iowa State's a huge Chicago fan base as well. So that was certainly interesting to me. But on the note of Coach K and Jim Beheim, you're seeing the influence. Because if Coach K never brings Jim Beheim onto the Team USA staff, I don't know if Duke's still standing right now. Because that 2-3 zone has been that important. You think about not as much in the Arkansas game, right? Like Duke dominated that game start to finish. But in the Michigan State and in the Texas Tech game, they won those games because they flipped to zone and the Spartans and the Red Raiders couldn't do anything out of that. They don't go up against that type of zone. I think it's going to be a different story against Carolina because of the fact that Carolina goes up against Syracuse. They've seen Duke's zone as well. But I think it's good. I think... I, you heard, I think it was Raffery talking about it a little bit too. Like he, he's got a nice bottle of wine for Jim Beheim waiting for him because, right. because of what he did and the, the implementation of the zone. It's a nice little ode to him. Yeah. It maybe isn't the exact same zone that I mean, I don't think anyone There's really principles is in the there. same exact. Yeah. But it is interesting. I feel like any postseason recently zone has become somewhat of a storyline, which adds more sort of, proof to the belief that the zone is the ultimate curveball in March in the postseason. I remember 
in the bubble NBA playoffs. I was going to bring that up too. Yeah, yeah. The, the Miami Heat. Heat just totally stifled my Celtics with it. There was, I think, several teams that used zone that year. And it's more of a, once we get into the game and things aren't really working great, then we switch to the zone. But a lot of teams go to different defenses in the postseason format, I think because you have less time to prep and all that. And usually it's a zone and then it comes back to Jim Beheim, which is kind of funny. Yeah. I, I thought it's, it's weird. Like you see coach K a guy who is held in the highest regard uh, of all college basketball coaches that are left standing. And he's on the, the sideline, run orange, run orange. Cause I, I believe that's what they call <laughs> it. it. It's called orange. Right. Because it is an ode to Syracuse. And yeah. so anytime you see uh, Duke drop back in their 2-3 zone and slap the floor, like that's Jim Beheim. That's a Jim Beheim influence right there. All right, well, we will dive into some football notes on the spring camp as we get ready for the spring game this week in a little bit. But if you don't have any of those final four teams and your bracket is completely busted, I know mine is not looking great at this point, but I've got some cash still from the tournament, and that's thanks to Stat Heroes Pick'em. If you haven't checked out this new platform, you are really missing out. Go to Stat Hero, where they have Stat Heroes NCAA single game pick'ems. It pits the star players against each other, an amazing hybrid between fantasy and sports gambling. You can take control back from those handicappers that always seem to have the advantage. You start focusing on players you know with a gameplay that doesn't rely on big spreads, long odds, or funky props. So if you don't like any of the final four action, well, maybe you go to Stat Hero and you identify a player that you think is going to show up, have a big game. Maybe Brady Manick turns in another strong performance for UNC. He could be a guy you're targeting over at Stat Hero. They simply post sets of players for you to take on with the set of player you choose, set of players you choose. Stat Hero is the easiest and fastest way to get your sports action fixed. It's at a simple and sleek gameplay. So sign up for free right now at stathero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. That is stathero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on for a 100% match. Some serious savings. Stathero.com slash locked on. Promo code locked on. Terms and conditions apply. So spring football is coming. It's kind of coming up quick here. You got the yeah. spring game, which... I'm a little interested to talk to Drew about later on this week, who's going to be calling the game, our friend for ACC Network, because it's not really something Syracuse does every year, and I don't really remember watching a spring game on ACC Network. This might be the first time it's been on TV. I'm not exactly sure about that, but I'll be curious. Is it like a full game? Is it more sets of drills? What are we going to glean from this? But I think some of the storylines that are forming here a couple players are getting some buzz in the spring camp that I'm going to be interested to watch. I would say Aronde Gadsden at the wide receiver position is kind of at the top of that list. He seems to really be garnering some hype, almost like Damian Alford was last year around this time. We'll see if it pans out. I think I'm interested to see Juwan Price, the new backup running back to Sean Tucker, comes over from New Mexico State. He's been in some scrimmage clips, scoring touchdowns. I'll be intrigued by that. But also the quarterback battle, I think, is yeah. is the big thing going into it, which seems like Schrader is definitely in the lead. But yeah. we'll see how the quarterbacks look. That's going to be interesting. I'd be shocked if anyone but Garrett Schrader is the starting quarterback right. when you get to week one here. But I, I do have to say it has to be an open competition. It has to be. If it's not, you're not doing your job here. And I really want to know what do Jason Beck and Robert and I think of Garrett Schrader because we see this all the time in the NFL when you bring in a new head coach and it's a quarterback on their second or, or first year of a deal uh, as a rookie, right? What does that coach think? Is it like, like I think about it all the time, like when Brian Flores had Tua or when Matt Nagy had Mitch Trubisky, like did they love those guys? No, they didn't. And it was kind of reflected and you didn't see very good offenses as a result of that. Those teams got to wins and playoff berths because of their defenses. And I would look, to, I would love to know what, what do these new offensive coaches truly think of Garrett Schrader and can you win and get to a bowl game with Garrett Schrader? Because the quarterback competition is really the only thing that I'm looking forward to during this off season. And again, I think it's going to be Garrett Schrader, but I would love to know how close is a Justin Lamson is a Dan Valari, is even a Jacobian Morgan. How close yeah. are they in this battle? 
Yeah, from what I've seen, and again, we're at the point of the season where you're just trying to freeze frame little scrimmage clips and see, oh, is that Dan Valari? What number is that? That it's that type of yeah. point of the and season. And like in, so, in the case of Dan Valari, it's like, what number does this guy even wear? Because sure. he wasn't on the roster last year. Right. So it's tough to I mean, you can't glean anything from it. And that's why I'm excited for the spring game because we haven't really had this opportunity in a while to actually see them play in somewhat of a game setting and say, all right, there's Dan Valari making a pass and I can make a, you know, calculation or analysis based on what I'm seeing in some type of live game setting. But it doesn't look like based on the scrimmage clips that he throws the tightest spiral ever. And I think we knew that going in. Mm -hmm. It's also when Dino's talked about it, it's similar to how he talked about Schrader last year in that quarterback battle and how he said, we're going to have to see once we get into a live situation. And he said a quote that was interesting about Valari in particular on how some of the best stuff that he does is maybe once it's sort of off the cuff and, right. and live situation type of situ type of stuff. So it's kind of like Schrader last year where I don't know how much Valari can leapfrog anyone in the competition when you're doing spring drills and he's not really getting hit that hard. Well, that's the same thing with Justin Lampson too. Dino came out and said, listen, this kid hasn't been hit since high school. Right? Yeah, right. Because he's a quarterback in the college system and he he plays quarterback and in practice quarterbacks don't get hit. Right. That That's just how it is. So I, I'm intrigued because I, I want to see what it, what happens when these guys do get hit and they don't really have that opportunity. Like, I, I don't think they're letting quarterbacks get hit in the spring game. I think that'd be really stupid to let them do something maybe like that, a little but, bit, but it's not like someone's going to come up the middle and just you know, throttle them. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, I think it's going to be more or less a scrimmage. Like it's what it is. Right. It's not, it's not guys, obviously they're going to try to get to the quarterback, but they're not going to be taking down the quarterback. And if they are, well, then I think we've got some other questions to ask about this program here, but let's, uh, I think the other interesting part too is, all right, we, the only known quantity I think on this offense right now is Sean Tucker. Everything else is up for grabs in my yeah. eyes. Maybe Matthew Bergeron. I, I do like sure. a little bit of what I've seen out of him, but everything else is really up for grabs. Offensive line, wide receiver. I mean, who is going to be the number one wide receiver, I think is a fascinating question because you brought up a name like Aronde Gadsden. Can he take that leap? I wouldn't expect him to leap into being the number one receiver for this team. Yeah, um, but it's there for the team. But taking, it's there, right, does. exactly. Yeah. Like, is it going to be Damian Alford who, all right, he had this buzz last year and now it's the leap to the number one, or is it going to be one of the guys that's already on the roster? Is it going to be Anthony Queeley finally having a big year or something like that? So yeah, I, I just, the, is it CJ Hayes too, the guy that they right. brought in from, from Michigan state to the transfer. There's so many question marks in the weapons category. Are we going to see the tight end used more as a pass catcher? And Dino came out and said something like, we've seen Rhino and we've seen Mahar and we've seen Mang all catch passes. And it's like, have we? Because like you can <laughs> say they do it in practice, but don't say that. And then get to your quarterbacks and say, well, this guy can't be really our starter because we have to see him do it in a live setting. We haven't seen Chris Elmore, Max Mang, Steve Mahar catch passes in live settings. We haven't. The tight end has not been a part of this offense the last how many years now. So really since Randy really, Pierce. Yeah. Since so, and even Ravion Pierce going into the season, it was oh, we got this really good Juco guy that's talented, and they used him for some memorable plays, but it wasn't like he was an integral part of the offense, right? They used him, I think. I, I was satisfied with how if, to take a Sean Tucker line, I was satisfied with, with the performance of the sure. tight ends then because they, they made big plays, right? Like, there is maybe what one memorable play from a tight end over the last two, three well, years. Well, Luke Benson has made memorable plays, but he's also tallied like 20 catches before he left or something like that. Right. And, and it's like the one screen pass that he caught for the, the long touchdown. What was it? Like an 80 or 75 yard touchdown yeah. that he caught. He, he and like, had a couple long touchdowns, but yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's, bending. you can count on one hand how many right. memorable plays. And, and I don't think you can necessarily say that about Ravion. Like Ravion Pierce made a, a ton of big plays over the course of his career. He made impactful plays. He also, took away some stuff with some penalties, but I, like, <laughs> right. you can remember Ravion Pierce, like the touchdown against UNC. I mean, he was amazing sure. in that game. So 
I yeah, I I just want to know what the weapons are going to look like this year because there's a lot that needs to be proven in, in the receiver room, tight end room, offensive line room, everything, a quarterback room, everything except the running back room. Like that is the only known quantity right now in my book for this Syracuse offense. And it, it listen, it's a damn good one too. It's a it's an all American known quantity. Yeah. So that's a good problem to have. Yeah, the offensive line. I saw some quotes this week from I think. Veterello or Bergeron talking to Stephen Bailey about how we're just now trying to make another leap. We made a little bit of a leap last year, but they still weren't overall great. And I think Garrett Trader's ability to scramble sort of hid the fact that, yeah. you know, the sack numbers went down, but that was partially because they just weren't dropping back to pass as much under Schrader. And also Schrader was good at getting away, maybe a little bit better than DeVito, who was fine. And how many that. times did we see Sean Tucker have 30 carries this year? Yeah, like, right. that's going to take your sack numbers down. Exactly. So pass protection is still very much a question mark. And you've got Chris Bleich, who had offseason surgery and isn't practicing right now. You've got Bergeron. I think you brought up a good point. He's another known quantity. You stick him at probably left tackle and you know he's the best offensive lineman you've got. Veterello is interesting because haven't loved what I've seen from him when he's been out there. Will he be the center? Will he be the right tackle? Will he start at right tackle, then move to center? Will they use him in both roles? There's some new guys in there. Kalen Ellis, who played pretty well last year. Josh Iloa, who maybe will play some center. I think the center position is very intriguing. And it's very obvious that Dino still wants to add someone to the offensive line that could start and someone to the defensive line. They had a transfer in from UCF over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Even I heard Josh Huff was playing some defensive line who's a running back. Oh, he did boy. play linebacker in high school, but oh, no. that that speaks to we need bodies in the trenches. Yeah, both sides. Lineman. Yeah. So th I'd like to see them add a transfer offensive lineman or a transfer defensive lineman, and probably both would be ideal. Yeah, I, I just think that kind of tells you what they've seen. If you're that actively recruiting on almost April, Right, but like it's happened before. I mean, this is something they usually add one guy in this time frame. Right, but like typically. you're trying to add starters, and I think and that's, that's the thing. The usually, it's a it's a starter. Some of them haven't panned out. Like Alexander, he was a starter in theory once we got to the start of the season. Then he quits on the team midway through. Uh, I'm trying to remember the Texas guy, Willie Tyler. I think last yeah. year who came and there was over the, the Arizona State kid too. Yeah, but, same but like thing. that's they, the problem is like. Those guys have been starters on bad units and you, you need to have a strong offensive line, especially with a quarterback who probably needs a little bit more time to throw back there in Garrett Schrader. If he wants to truly reach his potential, or if you have a young quarterback back there, like a Justin Lampson, if he, he's probably going to need a little bit of extra time because he was used to it in high school. So for guys who haven't had a lot of game reps at quarterback, um, you're going to need a, a really strong offensive line to kind of bring them along. And the fact that you're still trying to figure out who those guys are and they might not be on the roster right now for spring practices, that's a problem in my book. Yeah. All right. Well, we will have a lot more chatter on the spring game. That's going to be our big storyline and topic throughout the pod this week. So subscribe if you're a big football fan. We'll be talking pretty much each and every day the rest of the week about the spring game and what we're hearing from camp. It is that time of the year where I've pretty much given up on all my new year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right. And that is thanks to built bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually enjoy eating built bars. They're covered in hundred percent real chocolate. They taste like a candy bar, but are somehow good for you. Low calorie, high protein, and you can replace your candy bars with these because they are better. A typical candy bar, can be anywhere from two to 300 calories. Most built bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. So compare that to a candy bar, usually 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. They are healthy, they are good for you, and they taste like a candy bar. Go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15. That gets you 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off over at Built.com. So Felicia Legat-Jack, we got to talk about this. She is officially the new head women's basketball coach at Syracuse after Vaughn Reed spent a season as the acting head coach. Syracuse, as expected, was not very good this past year under Vaughn Reed. Don't really think that was because of Vaughn Reed. I think this was the obvious hire. Everyone yeah. was calling for it. It happened. 
haven't got a chance. I know she's did a press conference as we're probably talking right now, Monday morning. So we haven't got a chance to view that, which is always kind of interesting to me, but she seems fired up about it, has the pedigree. It's a no brainer hire that John Wildhack has made here. The only thing is, why didn't you just make it last year is my big question. I never understood why Vaughn Reed was the acting head coach for a season, especially when I don't know anything about Vaughn Reed and I don't, really know what his relationship was with Quentin Hillsman and how he viewed what Quentin Hillsman was accused of doing. But wouldn't you just want to totally scrub the culture and to hire a guy that was an assistant under Quentin Hillsman never really made a lot of sense to me, even when you knew that it was just for a year and he was kind of a lame duck type of situation. But we got to the right hire in the end. I, I just don't understand right. why we didn't get to it last year. I would guess, because if I'm remembering correctly, that story about Quentin Hillsman broke in August. It was late, yeah. It was late. And, and I wonder if Felicia Lega Jack even wanted to take the job then, because I think she was probably in a better situation at Buffalo. You have your recruits, like, taking a new job in college basketball in August or September or whenever this was. Yeah, that's a good point. That's yeah. tough. That's tough. It may have been just gotta... the only thing they could have done. Right. But and this was, was already a Syracuse roster, too, that, remember, everybody, yeah. literally everybody transferred out. So you're already scrapping and clawing for players. And then you got to do go through the whole recruiting process again. People are going to leave. You're going to have to get new players in, all that stuff. I, And she probably knew, listen, what, th this job's going to be open in the spring. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to be the front runner. And lo and behold, I'm going to find my way into a better situation on, on March 28th than I did on September or August, or August, whenever it was when coach Q was fired. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I guess I sort of retract my comments. I just felt like it was an opportunity for John Wildhack to come out and say, we absolutely do not condone all the accusations against Quentin Hillsman. We're a program that prides ourselves on better culture and all that. And, we care about our players and he, he just sort of was like, you know what? We're moving on with Vaughn Reed, who was his assistant coach for a number of years. And we're just going to try and get through this year and then reevaluate, which it was a very tough spot for John Wildhack. So I guess that's kind of his only option. Yeah. But the bottom line is Felicia Leggett Jack comes over from Buffalo. She obviously was a terrific player at Syracuse in the mid eighties, big East all conference player. And she had a very good long career at Buffalo. Also was a coach at Indiana, which I didn't even realize. Yeah, I saw Tom Buffalo. Crean was very excited for this hire. Uh, he oh, he really? was tweeting yeah. out support. Yeah, that, that him him and his family are like Tom Crean's seen her put in the work. So I'm, I'm excited. And Tom Crean, you can say what you want about him as a coach, but I, the guy knows basketball, right? Yeah. And, and he knows good coaches when he sees them. And uh, I'll take that ringing endorsement. Yeah, she was 202 and 115 overall at Buffalo and took them to a Sweet 16 in 2018, beat Syracuse in the Battle for Atlantis this past year. And that was kind of a funny moment because I think the writing was always on the wall that she was the main candidate. And that felt like just sort of more proof that, yeah, OK, if, if she's beating Syracuse at Buffalo and given Syracuse had an odd year and everything, but still it it was more of validation that she is the right hire. I agree. It, again, this was, and this really has been the tale of all of John Wildhack's big hires so far as it's been easy hires, right? Yeah. Like Gary Gate, that was an easy hire to make, right? When John Desco steps down, Felicia like a Jack, when, when you have the separation with Quentin Hillsman and, and the job officially opens up, it's a pretty easy hire to make. The hard one's going to be the men's basketball hire because I don't think there is a home run there. There's candidates, right? But right. I think it also says something too about what what's going to happen for anyone wanting this program, men's basketball, to go outside the family. It's not going to happen. Look look at the last two hires that, that John, the last two big hires, and really the only two big hires that John Wildhack has had to make in family and family. And, yeah, and Kayla Trainer too. Yeah. Kayla Trainer, yes, I'm forgetting yeah. that one. Yeah, so three for three there, and Kayla Trainer was another easy hire to make, right? Yeah, so it was only a matter of could you get her to come to Syracuse. Um, and that was obviously, I think, something that was sort of an afterthought when everything right. was sort of said and done. But it, yeah, the, the, these have been easy hires for John Wildhack. He's had nothing but easy hires and scandal to deal with over the course of his time as, as the AD of Syracuse. And I think if you're looking for what is the easy hire on the men's basketball side, it's probably Red Autry because he is the highest standing of the assistant coaches. Yeah. And you would be... 
it, like based on what we've seen, and I don't make too much of, all right, John Wildhack hired the women's basketball coach this way. So he's going to hire the men's basketball coach that way. But it's not like he's shown us that he's willing to go outside the family and, and try and grab a controversial candidate. And we've always assumed this, but it kind of eliminates the possibility of a NATO or whatever insert Rick hot name yeah. that, that you want. Yeah. So it's going to be an in-family hire. And even Bayheim kind of confirmed that with his comments at the end of the season about, we have a plan in place. I really think it's red archery. I, I don't know if the fan base is in agreement on that, but it seems like that would be the easy hire. And that would be based on what John Wildhack has done so far, the move he will likely make. It's the least slap in the face hire. Right. Yeah. Like if you hired Jerry McNamara, maybe it's better for the program, but that's a slap in the face to red who's put right. his time in with the program and all that stuff. Meanwhile, G Mac sort of the hot name on the block and who knows, maybe that means you let G what G Mac get away and go to another program and try to build it up that way. And listen, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing because lo look at, look at Carolina right now in family. I'm sure a yeah. lot of Carolina folks, knew the writing was on the wall that Hubert Davis was going to be the guy and didn't want Hubert Davis to be the guy. And there was certainly some questions about his qualifications to lead a top tier college basketball program. And in his first season, he has him in the final four as an eight seed. And maybe that's what we're looking at with red too. Again, it could also go the complete other way. And this thing flops as well. Right. <laughs> but like, just to say, like, we don't want Red because he's never been a head coach before, I think is a little bit foolish because when you've been coaching under a legend for as long as you have been, you learn some things and you you learn how to act in different situations. And boy, has Red seen a lot of those. Yeah. I look at Tommy Lloyd as well as a guy that hit it out of the park and was sitting under Mark few and learning things forever. Yeah. And Zag goes to Arizona very successful. And you can so. look at it the other way too. Look at all the Duke guys that have flamed out at the next yeah. level. Right. And I guess they took jobs that were slightly tougher maybe um, than, but in, in general, I don't think there's much to make of like Mark Adams. He's an older guy, but he was the assistant under Chris Beard. He steps in and has a good year. If, if right. you're a good coach and you were going to be a head coach at some point, I don't think it should be a, too much of a concern that you haven't been a head coach yet. And, I don't know. We'll see if you're, if you're been worried about that long I, enough, like, right. Like red guess. would be the pick based on that. Anyway, if, if you're actually concerned about that, then I feel like you'd be more inclined to not want G Mac than red based. Right. On it, it's one coach. thing. If you've been the longtime assistant at like coastal Carolina, right. Right. It's another thing to be the longtime assistant at North Carolina or Syracuse yeah. or Gonzaga, yeah. where you've had long-term stability at those programs. Yeah. All right, we will be back on the podcast tomorrow, continuing to get you guys ready for the spring game. Any other news that comes out? I know Judah Mintz has said that he's probably making his decision at some point this week with the Geico Nationals, and he's playing in that for Oak Hill. So we'll be on the lookout for that. Any recruiting news that comes across, we will have you covered here on the pod. Thanks for listening today, and we'll talk to you guys tomorrow.